Sorry, had to go get coffee too. <laughs> and Jennifer, are we ready? Yeah, we're ready to go. Thank yeah. you. Good morning, everybody. It's 9.02. I'd like to call to order the Thursday, March 17th, 2022 meeting of the Transportation Commission. We are being recorded. And Herman, could you or Jennifer please give a roll call? Yes, I, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, I will give a roll call if we can pause just a minute because we have half of our commissioners out of the room at the moment. Sure. Um, so good. as soon as they come in, I will begin the roll call if that's okay with you. Sounds good, thank you. And, and also just for the, the, the members of the public out there that don't know, we have a fire alarm in our building and and so you can, you can kind of see in the corner the light flashing on the side of the screen. So that's why we're here and not in the auditorium and most of them are, most of us are remote today. So everyone's patience is appreciated. I thought we were going to talk about the in the elevator. She said, still have four quarters of it. And if I could just ask if we keep the conversation to zero, because then Jennifer will have to mute us and then she won't know when I'm ready to roll. I was just going to say, Herman, are, are you going to keep the room open? You want to keep the sound open or do you have the access to um, unmute yourself? Yeah, let me let me test this. You're mute. OK, yeah, I'll, I can mute on my end. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. When I see someone's joined us uh, with the phone number ending in 1556, could you please identify yourself? Hello, this, this is Matt Fromer from Sweet, it's here for public comment. Great, it's Matt. All right, uh, Vice Chair Stan, I'm going to start roll call now. Thank you. Commissioner Olguin? Here. Commissioner Adams? Here. Commissioner Stewart? Here. Commissioner Brackey? Here. Commissioner Vasquez? Here. Commissioner Garcia? Here. Commissioner Hickey? Here. Commissioner Hart? Here. Did you not hear that? Yep, yeah. I heard that. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Beebe? Here. Vice Chair Stanton? Here. And Chair Hall? Excused. Okay. Thank you very much, Herman, for the world call. Uh, we have a series of public comments this morning. And let's start with Danny Katz of Colorado Perg for three minutes. Uh, Jennifer, is he available? I am, yes, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Katz. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, my name is Danny Katz. I'm the executive director of COPERG, the Colorado Public Interest Research Group. Uh, I'm here today along with a set of partners who uh, you'll hear from a little bit later to just speak about a uh, document that we're developing around rebalancing our transportation system. A uh, coalition of groups, including COPERG, Bicycle Colorado, Denver Streets Partnership, uh, the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP, and NRDC are, are working to dig through um, and lift up projects that we think would uh, warrant prioritization um, over the next coming coming years, uh, as well as identifying opportunities to fund those projects, either through current dollars or through some of the new federal dollars that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, we think that uh, a, the set of priorities that we'll be um, uh, presenting in the next couple of weeks to you all would be uh, a great ways to help expand options for Coloradans across the state 
um, to be able to have choice when they're making their travel plans, as well as a, a critical step to meeting our climate air quality, safety, and accessibility goals that are really key to our quality of life here. Um, we've all heard about the historic new funding, and it sounds like a lot of money, but we know it, it's not going to go as far as we all want it to go, so we're going to have to make priorities. Uh, we're also very excited to see the implementation of the CDOT Greenhouse Gas Pollution Standard, which we think offers new tools for CDOT and the local governments to um, ensure that we are um, creating more options. Um, the document that we'll be sending you in a couple of uh, in a week or so here uh, lays out some broad priority recommendations as well as some specific projects that we think you all should lift up, as well as some recommendations about potential funding you could pursue to to meet those projects. The five major areas are around the first one is around safety and vision zero. The second is around your, the main streets program and expanding that. The third is around transit, fourth is biking, and the fifth is around land use. We wanted to just say a few words about it today since um, we didn't have it ready to give to you today, but we will in a week or so. Um, and I just wanted to highlight from um, a one piece of it, which is the Vision Zero and the Main Streets piece, we really recommend a focus on um, eliminating injuries and deaths entirely on the high injury network. And on the Main Streets program, we recommend a focus on um, expanding that successful Main Streets program to really every Main Street that we have in our, our state. Um, we think that there's uh, been a good job of identifying the high injury network, um, and now we need to adequately fund those corridors, many of which are on CDOT highways. Um, and we think a, uh, the Main Streets program has offered just an excellent model for how we can be uh, improving the um, major arterials to a point where there really are people-friendly streets for everyone to, to, to live their lives. Um, the last thing I'll say is just some of the buckets of available money that we think are really good opportunities to use for these kinds of investments include the Highway Safety Improvement Program, which now has uh, guidance for states like Colorado to spend at least 15% of the funds on projects that increase safety for vulnerable road users. And there's also a new federal discretionary grant program called Safe Streets and Roads for All that has about $5 billion for safety projects. And we hope that CDOT and local partners will compete heavily for those. Um, again, there are a few other folks as part of this project who will be speaking later today around some of the transit biking and smart use ideas that we'll be presenting. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Katz. And next is uh, Ms. Jenny Gang of Conservation Colorado. Good morning, commissioners and CDOT staff. Um, my name is Jenny Gang and I'm the transportation manager for Conservation Colorado. We are a member-based organization with offices across the state, including Pueblo, Durango, Grand Junction, the Roaring Fork Valley, Fort Collins, and Denver. Our members' lived experience often informs our advocacy work, including today. This morning, I would like to touch on the importance of public transportation in our rural communities. The growing affordable housing crisis has devastated working class mountain communities, a large share of them low income and Latinx. Most, many people are unable to afford to live anywhere near where they work and face commutes upwards of 100 miles per day. In passenger cars, this compounds poor air quality congestion and of course the climate crisis. Additionally, many folks in rural areas lack easy access to services like medical care. If they do not own cars, these people may travel for a full day just to attend a doctor's appointment, since many bus routes operate on such infrequent schedules. This is especially impactful to our elderly communities. Increasing bus service in the mountain corridor is a solution that will have manifold benefits for our climate and quality of life. By increasing the bus staying service and its related components, CDOT has the chance to advance the state's goal of social, racial, and economic equity. I would also like to mention the Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Policy Directive and thank the Commission and the CDOT staff for your hard work so far. As the draft policy develops, I want to emphasize the importance of environmental justice. We discuss the term equity in multiple contexts, but I want to be specific about environmental justice. Firstly, it means directing benefits to disproportionately impacted communities, those who have been unduly harmed by pollution of all kinds, including transportation. These communities are overwhelmingly populated by low income, black, indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color, and tend to be located along major highways like I-70, I-270, and I-25. 
Secondly, the seriousness of the environmental violence faced by these communities demands bold leadership and changes in transportation planning at all levels, not just in the mitigation policy. So as you move forward with the policy directive, please give deep consideration to how we might prioritize investments in these communities, such as equity scoring requirements for each mitigation plan. And please consider how these principles might be applied to transportation planning in Colorado as a whole and what steps the commission might take to make that happen. Thank you for your time and I hope you have a good meeting. Thank you very much, Ms. Gang. We appreciate your comment. Uh, next, Mr. Tom Easley of Colorado Communities for Climate Action. Good morning, commissioners. I am Tom Easley with Colorado Communities for Climate Action. Thanks for this opportunity to briefly address two topics that will play a huge role in how successfully we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, now the largest source of emissions in the state and in most of the 40 local governments in the CC4CA coalition. First, we welcome the release of the draft clean truck strategy this month. It's a good framework to tackle truck emissions and there is no time to lose in implementing it. The climate crisis is real, as well as our air quality crisis. About three-fifths of the state's population now lives in severely unhealthy ozone pollution. We did not welcome the administration's decision to delay advanced clean trucks rulemaking in, until 2023. It further puts us in a hole as far as meeting the state 2030 greenhouse gas targets. That delay makes it critically important to use other transportation emissions reduction levers, such as the implementation of the three enterprises created under SB 260. All three should stress early action, including the clean transit enterprise administered by CDOT. Transit stands out as a way to reduce emissions, but also the benefit disproportionately impacted communities. That's why it was good to hear during your workshop yesterday, your enthusiasm about expanding your state transit services. Our members share that enthusiasm and want to work with you on making seamless connections between state and local service. The second topic I want to address is your greenhouse gas mitigation policy, one of the best levers you have to reduce emissions. As you make important decisions about the content of the policy directive over the next several months, we urge you to keep several key things in mind. Vehicle miles travel needs to be at the very center of the regional and state mitigation action plans. It's simple, VMT reductions means emissions reductions. It ought to be a key metric in evaluating and choosing multimodal options. Regarding the mitigation policy scoring system, simplicity and uh, understandability is a great goal, but that should not sacrifice accuracy. Projects should get mitigation credit to the extent they actually reduce emissions. Before the new system is finalized, it needs to be thoroughly stress tested. You should make sure that people knowledgeable about transportation planning are asked to do their best to break or game the new system. Once implemented, smart people will look for every way they can to game it. Let's find those openings now and get them fixed before launching. Finally, there needs to be a mechanism that links mitigation scores to actual performance over time. For example, if a plan uses transit as a mitigation, it shouldn't continue to get emissions reduction credit if the transit program operations aren't actually fully funded over time. Thank you. We really appreciate your hard work in breaking new ground on transportation policy. Thank you very much, Mr. Easley. We appreciate your comment. Uh, Molly McKinley from Denver Streets Partnerships Director, please. Transportation commissioners, and thank you for holding this space for public comment. My name is Molly McKinley, and I'm the policy director for the Denver Streets Partnership. We believe in an equitable and vibrant Denver that guarantees our public spaces are designed for people. We believe that human dignity should be the guiding principle for the design of our transportation system. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning with my other colleagues calling for the rebalancing of our transportation investments through land use, safety, main streets programs, bicycle and pedestrian improvements, and public transit. I'm here to speak about how essential public transit is to meeting the needs and the goals of our state. Communities across the state, including here in the Denver region, need access to public transportation that offers fast, frequent, reliable, affordable service that takes people where they want and need to go. 
I'm asking you to prioritize a couple of things related to public transportation. First, a regional network of bus rapid transit in the Denver metro region. Expanded busing routes to meet the diverse transportation needs of Coloradans and better connect our state and expanded transportation um, transit service operations, all of which have the potential to make public transit the most convenient and reliable way to get around our state. Our urban arterials like Federal Colfax, Colorado, currently present tremendous safety and access challenges, but also tremendous opportunity for the future of how we move people in the Denver region if we invest in bus rapid transit. Both busting and transit service operations present great opportunities as well. The groundwork and systems are already in place and an increase in funding will help meet the needs of Coloradans across the state. An example from here in Denver, and I think really highlights the potential of increased transit service um, from a 2017 report that the city and county of Denver did showed that more than 70% of Denver residents live within convenient walking access to transit but only 36% have access to convenient all day frequent service. So we're thinking about transit that comes every 15 minutes that you don't have to look at the schedule. You don't have to, you know, it's not a high risk situation if you miss a bus. To me, this really gets at the most compelling reason we have to invest more in public transit operations. It's not just about running more buses. It's about making real change that will improve people's lives and expand access to opportunity. With new state and federal funding, there are so many new avenues for funding transit projects and operations. Take, for example, the regional bus rapid transit routes that have been identified by Dr. Cog and RTD, many of which align with state highways. It would cost $1.3 billion to build out 10 of those routes, key connections in the Denver region. Thanks to the flexibility of new federal funding, these projects could be funded through federal formula funding and grants like you would expect, like the Carbon Reduction Program, but also through less obvious programs like National Highway Performance Program. Um, there's just a ton of opportunities right now and we should really be um, exploring them and using them to kind of the best of our ability. I thank you for hearing public comment this morning and look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you so that we can build a transportation system that expands equity and access while reducing our impacts on climate change and air quality. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your comment. Um, Mr. Matt Fromer of SWEEP, please. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, so good morning, CDOT commissioners. My name is Matt Fromer. I'm a Denver resident and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP. I'm here this morning with Danny, Molly, Peep and others to talk about our transportation priorities and the importance of smart land use in meeting our goals on climate, air quality, equity, transportation and affordable housing. As someone smart once said, the best transportation plan is a good land use plan. Locating housing closer to jobs, transit, grocery stores, schools, and other destinations aligns with CDOT's goal to cut pollution and congestion, provide safe and connected multimodal transportation, improve public health and equity, and support economic prosperity on main streets. When we prevent infill development, we inadvertently promote sprawl. It's like squeezing a balloon. Residents of urban centers and transit-oriented developments drive half as many miles per day as those living in single family suburban developments. The climate and air quality benefits of smart land use are evident in the modeling. Dr. Cog Metro Vision 2050 analysis shows that we need a combination of smart growth and increased investment in transit, bicycle and pedestrian, pedestrian infrastructure to hit our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Similarly, the compliance scenario model for CDOT's greenhouse gas planning rule assumes we focus 75% of population and job growth in urban centers and near transit. This is basically the inverse of the current trend in the Denver metro area, where about 75% of lots under development are new single family subdivisions on undeveloped land with little access to transit or jobs and services within walking distance. We continue to dedicate too much land to cars and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the minimum parking requirements, which are forcing new developments to overbuild on parking and dedicating far too much space to cars instead of housing and other spaces for people. A 2019 study from RTD shows that during peak periods, 50% of the residential parking lots near high frequency transit stations are sitting empty. That's during peak periods before the pandemic. 
this empty asphalt where we should be investing in good placemaking with affordable housing, businesses, restaurants, and thriving main streets. Infill development is one of the best tools we have to cut pollution and congestion. To quote one of my favorite transportation planners, if you're just focusing on transportation infrastructure, you're looking at the tail, not the dog. Now is the time to address land use before we add another 3 million people to our state. I also want to call your attention to House Bill 221304, mm -hmm. uh, which was introduced at the legislature last night. The bill would create a strong communities grant program to enable local governments to invest in infill infrastructure projects that support affordable housing, including zoning and mixed use and higher density around high frequency transit stations. We should think about how our state and regional transportation plans support these types of investments. And then lastly, I'd like to just express my support for CDOT's efforts to expand the busing system. I can't tell you how many emails I get from friends and colleagues asking how their visiting relatives can travel from the airport to the Western Slope and the solutions thus far have been underwhelming. So let's build a connected statewide transit system we can all be proud of and let's do it with smart land use principles in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, now, Pete Van Heuven, the Director of Government Relations from Bicycle Colorado, please. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Pete Van Heuven for Bicycle Colorado, and we represent the interests of the 2.3 million Coloradans who ride a bike every year. So thank you for hearing my comments. With multiple opportunities to reshape our transportation system through funding choices, 2022 is gonna be an important year to shift funding away from past priorities and toward immediate solutions that reduce vehicle trips. We agree with the previous testimony that public transit is one of the most effective ways to reduce VMT. And those benefits can go even further when better bus service is paired with non-polluting trips by bike or e-bike. Today, we're asking you please to prioritize the non-polluting bike ped projects that exist in state and regional plans, and also find ways to introduce, evaluate, and fund new plans for safe bicycle corridors that connect Colorado communities. You've heard the good news. There are multiple funding sources available for bike ped projects from both multimodal project funding sources and also all of the flexible dollars that can be used as well for multimodal projects. As icing on the cake, Colorado's Highway Safety Improvement Project Funds must use 15% of funds for multimodal projects in Colorado. The benefits of active transportation are obvious, but they're worth restating. Multi-use paths offer the choice to avoid a vehicle trip. They're a healthy choice for the planet and for people pedaling. They also come cheap compared to many road projects. When we're in the middle of a bike boom where there's more demand than ever, for example, South Suburban Parks and Recreation District reported a 93% increase in biking and a 64% increase in walking at the start of the pandemic. And there's little to suggest that demand has decreased. But the sad truth is there still aren't enough safe choices for people who wanna choose the handlebars over the car keys. There are some immediate opportunities though to fund the six signature bike projects that currently exist in the 10 year plan. And I'll just quickly list them. They're the Southern Mountain Loop Trail near Trinidad, a proposed bike ped trail on a former BNSF corridor in El Paso County, bike lanes on State Highway 96 near Pueblo, a Grand Junction bike ped path connecting trails along I-70, a Clear Creek Greenway to Peaks to Plains Trail that's part of the Floyd Hill Project, and a Sedalia to Castle Rock Trails Project that's part of uh, the US 85 um, Project. So although these are great options, unfortunately, there are really only a handful of them. And for the most part, we see that the state's bike projects are usually envisioned and then ultimately funded as smaller segmented pieces or as smaller mitigation measures that are tied to a project for another purpose. So we're asking you to please think bigger about biking. It's time to be proactive and to work with local communities to envision, plan, fund, and build connecting bikeways like the successful US 36 bikeway and other backbone signature projects that will support the growth of bike trips. One obvious place to start would be to double down on the larger multi-use path projects that are in Dr. Cog's envisioned regional bike network. Thank you. We look forward to working with you and CDOT staff in this exciting time. Thank you very much for your comment. And thank you all for making the time to come and speak publicly. It means a great deal to us and we are listening. If I could switch to uh, Jennifer for our written comments, could you please share those? Uh, yes, sir. 
Uh, we've received three comments. We have one from Brent G. Uh, he states regarding CDOT's draft GHG policy directive, the directive did not, does not sufficiently address the transportation equity issues that disproportionately impacted communities have suffered for decades. The commission should consider expanding upon the state's definition of disproportionately impacted communities to include transportation specific metrics like transit access, mm -hmm. transportation pollution burden, trans uh, traffic density, noise, et cetera. Further, the commission needs to do more to ensure that disproportionately impacted communities receive a larger portion of the transportation related funding to remedy past injustices and begin to restore balance to our communities across the state. Equity in terms of geography seems to be a focus for this commission, while equity in terms of access, affordability, safety, and health outcomes for DI communities seems to play a subordinate role. The commission needs to do more to center the burdens of disproportionately impacted communities and to involve these communities in determining what transportation dollars should be spent on. And of course, we need to invest less in highway expansion projects that increase pollution and traffic in surrounding communities while substantially increasing investments in public transit, biking, walking, and smart land use, particularly in urban areas. Um, Heidi L sent a message um, stating their commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to comment as you continue to develop the mitigation policy directive and procedural directive. 350 Colorado appreciates that you're addressing equity in your prioritization and that you're placing importance on looking at how projects affect disproportionately impacted communities. Placing in top priority choices that uh, decrease pollution and improve transportation access for DI communities and low income communities, you will address social equity. We urge you to consider the definition of equity in those terms and put in place rankings and procedures that will have the highest, most positive impact on social equity, along with the highest reductions in GHG. Geographical equity alone doesn't impact the issue of disproportionate impacts in fair and equitable ways. As you define disproportionately impacted communities, please consider adding transportation specific metrics, such as trans traffic density, noise, traffic fatalities, percent of income spent on housing and transportation, incidences of asthma, diesel part particulates, access to jobs, healthcare, grocery stores, et cetera. As you rank and assess mitigation projects, we recommend you have in place a system that contains an addition, uh, additionality test so that you accurately count GHG reductions that are created by the project, but exclude reductions that would have happened anyways due to other policies and or market trends projects that are already supported elsewhere through other policies. Uh, to achieve long-term BNT reductions and emission reductions, the highest priority should be transit, transit-oriented development and biking and walking infrastructure. Thank you for your consideration. And our final message is from Jason P. He writes, um, so I-70 eastbound is closed due to weather in the middle of the night, with no warning or signage on the highway. And now motorists are stuck on I-70 with no way to get off the highway. People are running out of gas and it's below freezing. Uh, meanwhile, the snow is continuing to accumulate. This is not safe and shows no consideration for motorists. Uh, this will only create more problems by creating more stranded people and vehicles on the highway. How do you close the highway with no plan to get motorists off the road? You're supposed to close at an exit with police directing traffic to get off the highway. You can't just leave cars sitting on the interstate. This is very poor planning and indicates a high level of incompetence. Um, I will note that I, I have forwarded that message to uh, John Lermay, um, and he has responded to this uh, this individual, and he can address that further if uh, you have concerns about that. But those are the three messages we've received. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you for moving that quickly up to John Lermay. We appreciate it. So let's now go to comments of individual commissioners, starting with District 1, Jessica Holgi. Commissioner Holguin, are you with us? The whole room was already hearing my comments. <laughs> um, I, I want to share that I am really concerned about this upward trend that we're seeing with uh, vehicles, drivers hitting our plows. Um, this is something that in an effort to move towards zero deaths, it's going to be critical that we engage in, in an education campaign. Um, and so, and ideally in a multilingual campaign. Um, at the last storm, I continue to see how many drivers were just passing 
the clouds. And I was like, this is this shouldn't be happening, and yet it is. And so because they, we have so many people who are coming from other states, and just as a reminder of how to, how to behave like a Colorado, I think it would be really helpful. Um, second, I want to take a moment to thank Pedestrian Dignity and uh, the individuals who organized the immersive experience for elected officials. Um, and I also want to thank CDOT staff for participating in some of those. Um, it, it does create a different experience when you can actually get out of your car and walk around. And so that's going to be a critical component as we continue to think about ways to, to design a transportation system that works for all. Um, and so it's no secret that Denver streets, especially Alameda Federal, continue to be a high risk. Um, and so the more that we can think about other ways of scrolling, rolling, walking, uh, will give us a better understanding of the comprehensive needs that our, our cities and um, our state has. So. Thank you for the space, and that's all my comments for today. Thank you, Commissioner Hogan. And let's go to District 2, Commissioner Adams. Well, good morning, everyone. I, I have a few things on my list I'd like to cover. The first is I'd like to wish everyone of Irish descent happy St. Patty's Day and wish and encourage everyone to be really safe. You know, I on behalf of what I call the Black Irish, I, I really would like to make sure that uh, that we don't let this wonderful holiday, it's one of my favorite all time, but I do recognize we all have to be careful during this time because some sometimes we Irish go to a little bit of the extreme. So be careful, but enjoy, enjoy St. Patty's Day. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is I would like to thank all of the women in CDOT and for having a wonderful month for us to recognize and celebrate all the great contribution of all of our women commissioners and staff members within CDOT, we're in extremely fortunate. I'd also like to thank all the other CDOT staff members for all the hard work and dedication to all of CDOT's efforts. You know, without all of your help, uh, we wouldn't be able to get the job done. I know there are lots of times people have uh, uh, observations and views about how we're able or not able to get all the things done that everyone believes we should, but. Trust me, I, I've never worked with a group of people who try harder to make all the pieces fit than the group within CDOT. Uh, it's spring break, so please be safe, be careful as you go about trying to enjoy the spring break holidays. I, I read uh, so many things about people who, while enjoying their vacations and holidays, tragedy strikes and other things happen. So. Please be careful during the uh, spring break holidays. So I'd, 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 I'll rapidly finish the rest of what I have to say. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate we were blessed the, uh, a couple of days ago that we were got through our Senate confirmation. So I'm glad to say that uh, I, I, I look forward to being given a few more years to represent District uh, 3 in, in uh, Arapaho and Douglas County. I'm excited about that. Um, I have been able to visit and attend the stack meeting, so I think they, they, Vincent does a great job of giving everyone a fair and great opportunity, and I learned so much from my involvement in the stack meetings, and I do look forward to attending them. I'm, I'm not always up to speed on all the issues, but I learn a lot. Uh, the other thing I had a chance to do during my uh, last 30 days was uh, Mayor, uh, the Lone Tree Mayor and her team all met with me. Uh, to talk about some of the things that they were concerned about. And I learned a lot about their Ridgeview community development and their interest in, you know, expanding the Lincoln access as well as working on the multimodal uh, uh, community uh, project they want to do. So that was really good. And lastly, I was able to attend the Dr. Cog meeting. So for me, you know, sometimes I don't have an opportunity to be as busy, but it's been a good uh, period of time for me to get to learn a little bit more about things going on within CDOT. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. And now District 4, Commissioner Stewart. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I really appreciate the time today to say some things that uh, are on my mind. I want to thank somebody I've never met. Her name is Zoe Wilhelmson, and she brightens my day every day when she sends me a list of uh, uh, publications, uh, news articles, uh, 
that have a number of different aspects to them. And I really appreciate it. I, I try to read everything I can, this transportation related, greenhouse gas related, that sort of thing. And she does a wonderful job compiling uh, so many different um, news articles uh, that um, I just want to thank her publicly. And she sends this out to all of us at CDOT. And I, I just, I haven't met her, but I really appreciate what she, what she does. Um, I want to talk about Mike Goolsby uh, for a minute. Um, you will hear that Mike Goolsby is retiring. I'm sure um, Chief Engineer Harrelson will have some things to say. But I, I want to tell you when I was the chair um, in 2020, um, I was on the Western Slope uh, a number of times with uh, both Director Rulu and um, uh, Commissioner Hall uh, during the Grizzly uh, Creek fires um, and the incident command over there and some of the things that were going on with uh, reconstruction of 550 and uh, some aspects of uh, construction over in Grand Junction. And I have to say that I I uh, really appreciate the time I spent with Mike Goolsby. I got to know him a little bit. Um, and I have to say that he is, in my mind, one of the most dedicated, talented, um, professional uh, people that I've worked with at CDOT. And um, I, I think well, CDOT's really gonna miss him. Um, I, I just felt like he was so down to earth, uh, was patient with me in understanding some of the uh, nuances of things going on in the Western Slope, uh, working on the reconstruction of I-70 after the Grizzly Creek fires. Uh, it was a yeoman's effort to coordinate and work on um, different aspects of that and the process of how that was gonna be done and working with the numerous organizations. Um, I'll leave the rest to uh, Chief Harrelson. I'm sure he has more to say, but did wanna thank Mike for his years at CDOT and tell him how much I appreciated him helping me understand what was going on when I was the chair of CDOT in, in 2020. Uh, chair of commission, not CDOT. <laughs> um, and then finally, I, I wanna uh, just say that um, after, after many years as the executive director of Smart Commit Metro North, I retired this month. Um, and I, for those of you who don't know what Smart Commute Metro North uh, is, it's a transportation management organization whose mission is to reduce congestion and improve air quality. And we've worked um, on that mission for, for many years and I, I've been pleased to be part of that. The reason I'm talking about this today is that um, in 2020, uh, Smart Commute was able to get some grant funding <laughs> to get some grant funding from um, Adams County sub-regional grant through Dr. Cog um, to start a shuttle service for workforce where no shuttle service was available. And uh, with the RTD as a partner and Adams County as a partner, City of Westminster and City of um, Thornton, um, all together we went after a grant and uh, put together a program that provided workforce uh, transit um, seven days a week, uh, something that hadn't been heard of before. And during COVID, uh, many of these workforce um, employees were um, essential workers at St. Anthony North um, Hospital Campus and um, at uh, the Amazon Distribution Center at 144th. And then the following year, uh, we partnered with uh, Colorado Energy Office to provide a program for um, low income verified participants within that catchment area uh, to provide e-bikes. And we've been doing that uh, for, for, we're well into the second year of that. And uh, we have been notified uh, that we are winning um, a Dr. Cog Metrovision Award in April. And I just wanted to call out my colleagues, uh, Carson Priest, who's the new executive director, Catherine Sanders, who does our um, modeling and all of our data collection, uh, Tam Tammy Harriet, who does the um, marketing and um, interagency coordination, and mostly Jean Shreve, who was our program manager for that wonderful program that I'm very proud of. And I'm so glad that everyone's still in place to carry that forward. So just wanted to call that out. Um, normally I, I, I don't do that kind of thing, but um, it's a pretty big award for us. And um, as I ride off into the sunset from Smart Commute, I'm really proud of the group that's still there to carry our mission forward. So thank you very much for allowing me those comments. 
Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. That's a wonderful uh, story, and we appreciate what you have done uh, in all your public service. Commissioner Brackey from District 5. Um, that's me. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Kathleen Brackey, uh, Transportation Commissioner for District 5. I appreciate being able to make some comments this morning, and I uh, of course want to say um, congratulations to Commissioner Stewart on her retirement, and again, all the, your years of service with the Smart Commute Metro North is um, amazing work, so uh, happy for you. Um, I also want to echo uh, Commissioner Adams' uh, wish for everybody for a happy and safe St. Patrick's Day, so I have the green scarf on today. Um, it's uh, To me, it's a really important um, day and just a fun day to uh, count our blessings. And for me, one of my blessings is that it's my daughter's birthday and today she turns 30, which I can't believe I have a daughter who's already 30 years old. <laughs> it's a big milestone. So anyway, extra happy uh, St. Patrick's Day to everybody uh, today and to stay safe. Um, I also wanna say thanks to all the public comments um, that were made this morning. I feel like that's something that's really opened up in our transportation commission meetings um, over the past year, kind of got started through some of the greenhouse gas um, process, but now we have more and more people coming to our meetings each week or each month and providing comments and suggestions and staying engaged in the process. So I really am excited about that and I hope people continue to engage uh, with us. In terms of other um, uh, transportation commission business topics from the past month, um, I was able to attend the North I-25 coalition meeting and also the North Front Range and Upper Front Range meetings. I want to say a special thank you to um, CDOT staff and uh, Director Rebecca White for making the trek up to Northern Colorado for both the North Front Range and the Upper Front Range meetings um, to come up in person and talk about the greenhouse gas topics. Um, that was uh, really appreciated and was helpful to foster the ongoing uh, dialogue and suggestions. I also want to to thank the North Front Range um, and Upper Front Range staff who have been participating in the technical committees on the GHG analysis. I know there are um, several staff are involved in multiple committees and really helping to provide um, assistance and contribution and collaboration. So I, I appreciate all of the work again, both by CDOT staff as well as the MPO staff that are um, contributing um, to all of that. Um, I was great to have our conversation yesterday with the TC and our workshop and others may speak to this as well, but I think we're making good progress and um, on our um, ongoing work to um, put the GHG um, protocols in place. So again, um, encourage folks to get involved and stay involved in those conversations as we go forward. Some great suggestions we've heard this morning. And then my last thank you is to the uh, Fort Collins uh, Chamber of Commerce. They hosted an event um, at the beginning of the month um, to, to restart community dialogue and civic conversations. And the first topic they chose was transit. And it was a really great open public meeting. Um, it was hosted by the Horse and Dragon uh, Brewery in Fort Collins and people came in and just talked about transit just directly. It wasn't um, you know, open conversation with community members, all ages and stages of life. And to be able to hear directly from people about what is working today for transit and what they would like to see into the future. So I was thankful to have had that opportunity to hear from people as we got the great update from Amber Blake yesterday on transit for CDOT and opportunities for us to continue to work on ways to advance um, uh, CDOT's transit as well as uh, integrate in with local transit. So I feel like there's a lot of exciting things happening at this uh, moment in time. And I just appreciate all of the engagement from the Transportation Commission, the CDOT uh, staff and our community members to help uh, push all of this forward. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brackey. Uh, Commissioner Vasquez from District 6. Yes, thank you for the time to uh, share some comments with uh, our participants from outside CDOT as well as the commission and CDOT itself. <clears throat> First, I, I want to wish Mike a very happy retirement. He will sorely be missed in Region 3 and throughout CDOT. All of this uh, service to CDOT over the years has been amazing. And I know um, Executive Director Lou will agree. <laughs> she is losing a, a really uh, strong person in Region 3. Uh, I want to thank all the individuals who made public comment today, in particular, Danny, Jenny, Tom, Molly, Matt, and Pete. I look forward to seeing the document that they have in preparation that may give us some uh, ideas we haven't thought of in terms of 
improving uh, options for transit and uh, bike pad and reducing greenhouse gas uh, emissions in, in the wake of those changes. I've been working, of course, with Commissioner uh, Hickey and Commissioner Stewart on the Interagency Committee and can only say how amazing uh, Rebecca White, Teresa, and the rest of the staff supporting this work on the mitigation measures and the policy directive. They have burned the midnight oil and educated us as we've been moving forward in, in the many meetings that we've held to try and help where we can. And I look forward to continue to working with them as we ripen the policy directive and the mitigation measures. I participated in the CDOT uh, Strategic Transportation Plan Workshop. I'm very pleased to see a, a renewed focus on how we go about improving safety. Look forward to seeing more on, on those efforts. But I want to spend the majority of my time, if I can, on two things. One, uh, as far as environmental justice and equity goes, one of the important tools that's being developed is called the EnviroScreen uh, tool. Is being developed by CDPHE uh, with uh, Dr. David Rojas at CSU. I was pleased to be able to provide feedback on their beta version and ask them to include transportation as a key variable in the mapping that they're going to be doing on this uh, screening tool. So we'll see what happens in their second beta version when I get a chance to see it in, in April. And finally, uh, wildlife and wildlife uh, passage structures uh, to provide permeability on our transportation corridors has been an issue I've been very interested in from my outset on the Transportation Commission. And we have two things happening. One, I, I was just talking to John Cater of FHWA. The IIJA has $350 million uh, dedicated over five years to wildlife crossing safety program. It's a competitive grant program. I'm hoping that Colorado will join the, the dollar rush, if you will, in applying for some of those uh, funds to enhance our ability to deliver wildlife uh, structures on our transportation corridors, particularly in areas that have been highlighted as important for migration. And at the same time, uh, SB 22151, the Wildlife Safe Passage Act, <clears throat> has been introduced in uh, the Colorado Senate. Um, we hear updates on that from Andy Carcian. I will be sending out uh, some emails just to share information on that bill and the FHWA program, hoping to bring more focus on uh, the important work that will preserve our wildlife migration corridors in Colorado. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, District 8. And, and I'll, it's probably Garcia. Seven. 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 I am your commissioner from District 8. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome this morning. Um, I would also like to echo uh, um, congrats to, to uh, RTD uh, Goose, uh, Mike, who's leaving. And uh, we've had two leave in uh, recent times, and we have some wonderful ladies filling those spots. And so um, I'm just wondering if the transportation should. Transportation Commission should approve these departures, these retirements. <laughs> <laughs> it's called bondage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, let's see. Well, I was excited to be part of the uh, confirmation hearings with the Transportation Committee. Uh, I'm excited to be part of that process. Don't get to the Capitol often, so it was nice to be on the Capitol grounds and see all the activity. Um, excited to be here. I was also appointed to the, or soon to be appointed by the Senate uh, to the Clean Transit Enterprise. And in our work this month, 
we didn't have a report from Kay Kelly, but I wanted to report as your representative on that enterprise that Kay and her group are working very hard and moving that effort forward, uh, including the rule, much like what we did with the greenhouse gas rule. So a lot of excellent work taking place there. Good job, Kay and your team, as well as the other board members. Uh, Matt was appointed yesterday as well as a board member. So uh, we have a solid enterprise board that, that is moving that work forward. That's exciting. Let's see. Um, I've also been working with CDOT staff, uh, Bob Pfeiffer, on the fiber uh, in our, our CDOT right away. So we would have a presentation tomorrow and we'll have a presentation this afternoon, time permitting. And I want to mention the CDOT staff for doing a great job on extending fiber in our right of ways and working with uh, with providers that are, are seeking work in our right of ways. I mentioned this back in July during our retreat that I think it, it's an important part of CDOT's role to extend uh, fiber to our rural communities. Uh, the private sector is not doing that, and part of our, our need to cover CDOT needs with communications along our right of I think it's imperative. So uh, looking forward to, to Bob's presentation a little bit later. And I think uh, those are the two things I wanted to report on. Still active with uh, TDRs in, in my region and working with uh, Julie Constant on activities uh, in the region. Uh, still winter, thanks to CDOT staff for keeping our roads plowed and safe. Um, hopefully we get some more moisture here in March. Um, we need it, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Commissioner Hickey, District 9. Thank you, Lisa Hickey, Commissioner for District 9. I too want to thank Mr. Goolsby for all his work and for being such a dedicated professional and uh, wonderful person to work with in the time I've been on the commission and wish him congratulations and, a, and an exciting retirement. Um, we, I want to also <clears throat> thank the um, CDOT and the commissioners who served previous to me for their decision to try to move dedicated funding towards rest stops. I think that's important for the safety of the traveling public. And I wanna to speak today on, on behalf of an underrepresented community, I think, which is the commercial drivers who are not truck drivers traveling around the state. And so I'm talking about all the people that make their living driving the roads of Colorado which includes myself sometimes. I often stay in a rural hotel and I watch people get up early and have their coffee and free breakfast and get on the road. And they're driving a truck to an oil rig or they're trying, or they're traveling salesmen and women, or they are uh, driving some commercial van and they have such need for services and safe and efficient highways. And so that's a big part of our job is to help provide that to them, which also speaks to the need for rest stops. But I'm very sensitive to the fact that rest stops can provide economic development uh, stimulus. I know that in Trinidad and Burlington, I'll stop and at the welcome centers and then look around and say, let's wander over to this business because it has brought me off the road and uh, given uh, a pause in the high-speed travel. And so I think they can really promote economic development and yet they can also uh, be seen as um, taking people off the road where they otherwise would go to another commercial um, outlet. And so we will continue to be sensitive to those, all of the myriad of needs that we're balancing. Um, finally, I think I would turn to the greenhouse gas uh, work that we're doing. My goal is to increase transparency and be responsive to the issues raised, for example, at Stack, which we hear every month which speak to the needs of all of Coloradans, which we want to respond to, provide transparency and much more education about what's going on, both in the policymaking and on the ground, step-by-step step as we proceed 
while not letting it take up all the oxygen in the room, pun intended, from the Transportation Commission's vital work in all areas. And so I want to incorporate it and uh, not let it supersede all of our other important work. So, so I'm certainly dedicated to that work as chair of the ad hoc committee, but that's my, um, my balancing act that I just wanted to express openly. So thank you for the opportunity to serve District 9. Thank you, Commissioner Hickey. Uh, Commissioner Hart of District 10. Commissioner Hart, District 10, are you there? And we'll come back to Commissioner Hart. Uh, Commissioner Beatty, District 11, please. Yeah, um, I wanna also give my regards to Mike Goldsby. Um, you know, definitely one of the, our regional directors that will be missed for sure. Um, but uh, I'm sure we'll find a good replacement to fill that area, but uh, he will be missed. His expertise and history and knowledge that he always would share is, was always good. So um, good luck in your future endeavors, Mike. Um, I'd like to address our the comments from this morning from the, the public. Um, I appreciate the, the involvement and other groups and people looking at how we can improve the system. I do have a caution that we uh, make sure we, we honor our uh, robust uh, public planning process of, that we have with all the MPOs and the transportation regions um, and make sure that all the recommendations moving forward are still ran through our, our normal um, public outreach and the planning organizations that work to try to balance all the needs of the communities that they serve, so the uh, Dr. Cobb region, the North Front Range, um, and all of them, because uh, I don't want to get in a position that things start coming to the commission for us to try to supersede what uh, our other robust planning process already entails, trying to tie all the many pieces of the transportation system that we, we work on on a daily basis to try to balance the needs and, and preservation of the system and safety of the system, and then planning to bring in new uh, new aspects or improve aspects as we, we can find funding to help. Uh, definitely appreciate the outside looks. Um, we always need that from, from all perspectives on the best way to balance our system. So um, for my district, we had a, a TPR meeting on Monday. Um, one of the presentations was on a project that was just completed that was part of the 10-year uh, plan um, and the added funding that we had to get that done. It was on uh, US 385. Um, it was a $6.35 million project that did 6.3 miles of uh, mill and fill to reconstruct the road surface. Plus they added uh, six foot shoulders on both sides. So we added 12 feet to the wide width of the road to handle the wide loads. Um, that come down those roads because at times they would actually get, you have a, a cattle truck and then you have a wide load and there was nowhere for them to get off the road. So you, they'd either have to, you know, a cattle truck with live animals. You don't want to tip them too much because you can actually cause them to tip over. So uh, adding these shoulders um, is a big help. Unfortunately, I think there's, there's hundreds of miles out in my district that need shoulders added because there's many of them that have no shoulder. The white line is the shoulder, um, which does not work well when you have either inadvertently get off the road and you're suddenly off the shoulder and can cause accidents or if you're needing to actually use that shoulder to help get around wide loads or things. Um, and the process that was used in this, I think was very efficient to get, uh, you know, just over a million dollars a mile to add 12 foot of lane plus reconstruct the road surface, um, I think was a very cost effective way and the way it was done. They added the shoulder at the same time, the, the fill they needed, and it was very efficient. So it was not impacting the traveling public as much as some of our projects where we go down the long lanes for long distances and things. So it sounded like it was a very good project the way it was designed and implemented. And then the cost, seemed very reasonable because at times I heard it was going to be a million dollars just to add shoulders, but we actually redid the surface of the road plus added 
the shoulders for a million dollars. So um, I hope we can look at those to try to stretch our dollars further in the future on those sorts of projects. Uh, so we can add the safety aspects. Um, one other thing that just happened with the passage of uh, the omnibus bill to extend funding, um, the Ports of Plains Corridor in Texas and New Mexico was designated in that as future interstate. So that will um, upgrade that those routes that with that current route will put a lot of the additional traffic as it develops onto the I-25 corridor as it currently lays uh, without the improvements to the corridor through my district um, that would encourage uh, traffic shift out of the heavy populated areas into possibly a more rural area that has open roads, but uh, already heavily used by truck traffic. So um, that's a concern for me when we're not looking at our state system and how we interact with the other states around us as they are making improvements that will impact our system into the future and possibly make congested corridors even worse without us looking at improvements to some of our corridors. Um, one other thing, when I, uh, last meeting, I missed commission meeting because I was going to visit my daughter in Hawaii, in Honolulu. Um, the interesting thing I saw there was um, some of their interstate through Honolulu, their speed limit was actually 45 on the interstate because to handle the, the traffic volumes and things and then traveling through their downtowns where they actually have just the right lane uh, was actually also the bike lane and then how they shifted parking in and out during times of the day on, on the one lane kind of made it when you're not used to suddenly at night or whatever that lane is no longer a travel lane it's parking lane and different things it kind of took a little bit to get used to but it was interesting to see um, how they handled the biking and then the setting of speed limits um, I know we always hear we need to have a speed study and it may increase the speed on some of these and I, I don't know where that policy is but in our safety uh, discussions in the future I think we really need to look at how we set speed limits because there are certain corridors like federal Colfax and the metro areas and even rural towns that it's a balancing act between where the public wants to drive and what we should be doing because of the other interacting of uh, other travel modes in the area whether it be biking or walking and people needing to cross the streets or just all those other different factors and I'd really like to dive into that in more depth as a commission and and figure out how we balance that a little bit better and not always because uh, being a county commissioner, I think sometimes you just have to set a speed limit that makes more sense, regardless of what the public wants to do and then the enforcement to follow up behind that, which they have very strong enforcement. You just saw the policemen all the time. So that was how it, it helped balance all those different things throughout the area. But seeing their system, they have many of the same issues we have. They have driving around the island, you see areas that need rehabilitation and uh, rebuilding. And then you have the projects that are being done. And as I mentioned yesterday, their transit project that looks to be a little bit of a boondoggle. Um, you wonder where how that gets to that level with that much money and uh, not be getting to a, a good useful purpose for the public when it has been in process for many years and they're still struggling to even actually get it built and usable um, in the billions and billions of dollars. So um, hopefully we can prevent and not get into those, that sort of a situation here because I, it gives the public or the commissions and the people that are in charge of that are a really big black eye and it, it's hard to ever dig out of um, from reading the articles and things when I was researching on what was going on with it. So hope we can prevent those things here. Thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Beatty. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Commissioner Hart, are you there? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. We got some heavy winds down here and uh, power flashed out and <laughs> my internet decided not to work for a little bit. So, uh, but I'm back on for a bit. But thank you. Just a couple of real quick comments. Uh, I've been listening to my fellow uh, commissioners. I don't want to repeat what they have been saying, but I do want to say that uh, I'm actually pretty thrilled with some of the feedback that we're still getting on the greenhouse gas 
uh, issues, particularly the uh, implementation issues on the policy directive and the uh, procedural directive. Uh, I think all of that is very helpful. The um, uh, the confirmation hearing uh, uh, that we participated in uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, uh, was very interesting. The feedback that we got from uh, some of our uh, senators in the General, General Assembly. And, uh, you know, the, the main question that I, I thought that I walked away with from that was, uh, you know, a lot of anxiousness uh, and, uh, and the uncertainty on how the greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, rules will work um, and how that's going to be balanced out with all the other things that we need to do, all the work that we're doing to uh, continue to do all the great work we do through CDOT and recover uh, and, uh, and actually uh, improve our transportation system on roads and bridges. Um, and so uh, the, the, the central question that it seemed like uh, I got asked and several of us got asked was, uh, well, heck, isn't that a heavy lift? Uh, do you have enough money to do it all? Uh, I, I think that all of us answered uh, uh, that uh, yes, uh, we can and will do all of it. We have a great staff in CDOT. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, group of members on the uh, commission right now, and uh, I think that we've got our sleeves rolled up. We're listening to the feedback, and uh, we're going to do their best we can to roll it out. And I really like the conversation we've had over the last couple of days, how we're going to be very much engaged um, in uh, adjusting as we go, throwing out models, testing models, seeing how things work coming up with ideas and uh, including those into our uh, a menu of uh, ways to control greenhouse gas as we do do our uh, future projects and, and uh, planning for those projects. So uh, at any rate, uh, it was an interesting process. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been grilled on political issues for things <laughs> I don't have a heck of a lot of control over, but uh, uh, it was fun uh, nonetheless. And uh, uh, my hats off to my fellow commissioners that went through that, and uh, and I'm so very happy and proud to join our commission, and I'm extremely pleased to work with this incredible professional staff uh, that we have here at CDOT. So those are my comments this morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hart. Great comments. Uh, for myself, I'm, I've been thinking about the Ukrainians a lot lately. You know, they're fighting for democracy every day, and uh, they're in a war, and it reminds us never to take our democracy for granted. And as Commissioner Hart and others said, we are all so very proud to be part of the CDOT family, uh, which fosters open dialogue feedback. This is really a part of democracy. Our public comments are part of democracy, including criticism. The fact that somebody could uh, send in a criticism and within a few hours, get it to the head of uh, maintenance and uh, that it was responded on and people weren't arrested for making comments, that's democracy. I appreciate uh, open comments from all of our commissioners. There's no fear. I appreciated uh, Commissioner Beatty's comments about needing to balance uh, the process with people who may have more time to make public comments. And I also look back at what we do with the stack the MPOs, the TPRs, uh, Rebecca White, uh, taking the time a whole day to go up to the North Front Range and back to take CDOT to people. That's democracy. Kathleen Brackey talked about people talking about transit in Horse and Dragon. That's democracy. And we have public service from people across the state, people like Mike Goolsby. Uh, who we all very much value and appreciate his service. Also, this past month, uh, the interns reported out, and what a remarkable group they were. This uh, year, uh, Gary Vansich arranged to have Piper Darlington, Dot Walsh, and Dr. Curtis Walker and others speak as former interns of what they had been doing. Our own Jennifer Uberhaller is a intern, and I will try to put the replay up on the chat at some point. Also on the safety side, STSP briefing March 31st, and uh, there's a new safety dashboard. I'll try and put that up a little bit later on. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me turn over 
to Executive Director Shoshana Liu for her report. All right, um, thanks. And we, we've heard a lot about the kind of salient issues over the course of the updates this morning. So I, I wanna just quickly focus my comments on Mike. You, you, you've heard a bit, bits and pieces from many people about the wonderful work he's done for the department. And I wanna pick up on something Karen Stewart, who is from a district nowhere near uh, the one where Mike serves, met, uh, said met, mentioning that she had had a chance to get to know him. And I wanna talk a little bit about why. Um, a lot of people who are not directly in Mike's line of sight got to know him because through a combination of uh, cir circumstance and being the kind of person who can rise to those challenges, Mike has dealt with some of the hardest things that we've had to work on as a department, you know, in the three plus years I've been here, but going far, far beyond that. And, you know, Mike is actually a second generation CDOT daughter, so it's going to be the first time in many, many decades that we're not going to have a Goolsby in CDOT Region 3. I've been told uh, that his daughter, who has many, many talents, has uh, expressed that she is not interested in coming to work for us, which is sad, but the the, the world could use her uh, excellence as a pastry chef and many other things. You know, the, those kinds of assignments fall to people somewhat randomly, but, you know, the people who can take them, take the ball and, you know, are given more balls to run with over time. And, you know, in every place where I've uh, worked with Mike on one of these hard things. And, you know, they they, they range from the kind of day-to-day -day crises to some of the hardest things we deal with in public service and safety agencies to, you know, just complicated project management. You know, he's always risen to the occasion, whatever it is. And, you know, with a kind of calm, you know, uh, empathy for other people, you know, good, good humor, even when it's hard to achieve that. And, you know, I, I can say having been uh, stuck in many foxholes with Mike, there's nobody with whom I would have rather had that those experiences. And, you know, Mike, I'll miss you a whole lot. Uh, we all will. You know, lots of talented folks on the Region 3 team. So, you know, the good work will continue. But I just, just want to kind of tip my hat to Mike as we say goodbye at his last formal commission meeting. The important uh, fact that he will still be technically an employee next month when he is taking the vacation he truly deserves. You know, I also just want to uh, throw congratulations from all of us to um, Mike's wife, Missy, who has an incredible professional opportunity as they move into their next chapter. And it's very exciting for us to, you know, hear about the whole family moving to a new and exciting uh, chapter of their personal and professional lives. So, you know, all, all of us uh, salute her too and the whole family. Um, finally, the only other thing that I would mention is that the uh, word of caution on driving today, um, thanks to Warm temperatures and the incredible work of our folks. The roads are in good shape and look good, but it is still slippery. There's a lot of precipitation everywhere in the metro area. And it's the kind of day where it looks like things are more, you know, more okay than they are if you drive too fast. So uh, wh whether you're celebrating any of the world religions holidays that dictate caution today, uh, drive safe. Thank you very much, Director Liu. Uh, Chief Engineer, Steve Harrelson. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I also want to jump on the, the bandwagon with Mike. You know, he is uh, just simply a, a wonderful uh, human being, wonderful manager, wonderful RTD. Um, as many of you know, he, he came up on the maintenance side. So he's done a wonderful job on, uh, you know, giving reality checks to the engineering side. I think, um, it, you know, there, he has a practicality that many engineers lack and um, he's not in, intimidated by, by anything or anybody. Um, there, there's a, an old expression in CDOT about bleeding orange. And, uh, you know, Mike's picture is next to that. I mean, he, he bleeds orange like nobody I've ever known. So the other thing I like about Mike is um, he's, uh, he's the number one fan of the Chief Engineers Book Club. And <laughs> to, to that uh, end, you know, last summer, you may remember, um, I, I, my selection during the, the big flooding crisis in Glenwood Canyon was a, a book called Wooing a Harsh Mistress. So um, I, I was able to uh, obtain a fresh copy of that. Um, since it's got such a wonderful title, I, I thought about photoshopping a, a photograph of Mike's face on a Fabio romance novel cover <laughs> and creating a... Uh, a special edition of the Chief Engineers Book Club just for Mike, but I thought that might not be tasteful. So instead, I'm I'm going to circulate this. I'd hope to circulate it in the meeting room, but since we're gone, we've gone remote today. Um, I'll circulate it over the next few weeks and and hopefully get a lot of people to sign it and uh, 
and, and give Mike a nice souvenir, um, both of Glenwood Canyon and of all his friends at, um, at CDOT. So those of you who are at, at headquarters today, uh, be sure and stop by and, and sign on it. Um, speaking of Engineers Book Club, uh, you know, this month is uh, Engineering Women or Women in Engineering Month. So I, I thought I could not let that pass up uh, without uh, mentioning it. Um, the, the book this month is called The Engineer's Wife. It's a story of uh, Emily Roebling, who was the wife of Washington Roebling, who was the chief engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge. And when Washington um, was overcome with uh, uh, the bends, uh, Emily became his eyes and ears. And she became, you know, was pretty much the uh, the chief field engineer for probably one of the, the the most memorable projects in civil engineering history. So this book, I, I've only started reading it. My wife suggested it, and uh, so I I, uh, I wanted to bring it forward. I've not full disclosure. I've not finished the book, but what I've read thus far is wonderful. It's called The Engineer's Wife by Tracy Enerson Wood. So also on the topic of uh, Women Engineering Month, um, you know, I think it, it helps to look backward to appreciate where we are. So I've got a little story. I wasn't sure how I wanted to tell the story, but um, I decided to, uh, to take a page from Paul Harvey. So those of you who are as old as me will remember Paul Harvey. For those of you who, those of you whippersnappers out there who've never heard of him, um, I'll give you a little bit of history. He, he was an Oklahoma farm boy who in probably 1940 or so uh, moved to Chicago to make his fortune in the radio business. Um, the radio bosses scrubbed away his Oklahoma accent and gave him this wonderful baritone staccato radio delivery. Um, and they, they were unable to completely scrub away the Oklahoma redneck, which was part of his charm. So for the next 50 years, he broadcast uh, three times a day on pretty much every AM radio station in rural America. I think towards the end, um, stations like KOA picked him up. But for much of his career, he was kind of the voice of rural America. So if, if you had the good fortune of uh, listening to KBRR in Leadville, um, you would hear him three times a day. In the morning, uh, he would do news and comment. At lunch, he would do news and comment. And in the afternoon, he had this feature called The Rest of the Story, where he would tell kind of a story about a famous person, and then, you know, he wouldn't uh, let the secret out till the very end, and then he would say, um, now you know the rest of the story. So I'm going to jump into character as Paul Harvey, and I'm going to do my best um, baritone staccato delivery. I, I don't have any Oklahoma redneck in me, so you'll just have to imagine that, but so here goes. Here, Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. Stand by for the rest of the story. Catherine Cleveland was a precocious little girl. From an early age, she was a great student. Smart, inquisitive, she was the apple of her daddy's eye. Sadly, when she was eight years old, her father, Charles Cleveland, died, leaving her, her sister, and her brother to be raised by their mother. They left their home in Kenton County, Kentucky, and moved to the city of Lexington, where other family members were available to help the young family. Catherine continued to work hard in school, and in 1920 was accepted into the University of Kentucky to study civil engineering. Such a path for a young woman was unusual in 1920, but Catherine persisted. She worked her way through college, working as a drafter for an architectural firm in Lexington. When graduation day arrived, few were surprised that she was ranked at the top of her class. The National Engineering Honor Society, Tau Beta Pi, which is engineering's version of Phi Beta Kappa, was perplexed. Never had they bestowed their membership upon a woman, and no one could remember a woman who had, was qualified by graduating in the top tier of their class. Many were dead set against allowing her in. Others supported welcoming the brilliant student. A compromise was reached. They awarded Catherine a pin, recognizing her work as a scholar, but did not welcome her as a full member of their organization. Disappointed, but undaunted, Catherine took her new engineering diploma and moved to San Francisco, where she worked in the office of Julia Morgan, the first woman licensed as an architect in the state of California. Morgan's firm did considerable work for William Randolph Hearst, including the Hearst Castle in San Simeon and the Los Angeles Examiner Building in Los Angeles. 
Whether Catherine, as a young engineer, worked on these particular structures is lost in the mists of time, but she clearly worked at this legendary firm. After a few years in San Francisco, the Bluegrass State called Catherine home, and she returned to Lexington, where she again worked as a structural engineer in Lexington. Page two. That's what Paul Harvey used to do, too. In 1929, Catherine married Lloyd, a young man she met in college. Though a few years earlier, Catherine had been the better student at the university, Lloyd had received the Tau Beta Pi key while she did not. True love won out, and they did not allow such differences to come between them. In 1929, it was very unusual for a newly married woman to continue working, so Catherine abandoned her engineering career. Catherine and Lloyd moved to Stone, Kentucky, where Lloyd worked at the Forts and Coal Company, mining and processing metallurgical coal that Henry Ford used to make steel to build Model A's. The couple had three children, and Catherine spent all her energy raising those kids. By the time World War II started, the family had moved from the coal camp back to Lexington. As her kids were older and the war situation demanded it, Catherine returned to work. Unable to find work in the engineering profession, she taught high school math for a number of years. In the years after the war, Tau Beta Pi was faced with the prospect of female members with increasing frequencies. What in 1924 had been an unprecedented anomaly, by the 1950s had turned into at least an annual occurrence, and by the 60s, the rate had increased even more. In 1969, 45 years after Catherine's graduation, Tau Beta Pi finally voted to accept women members. In honor of her pioneering place in the engineering profession, Tau Beta Pi bestowed on Catherine Cleveland the first female membership and declared her the first lady of Tau Beta Pi. Her husband, Lloyd, her children, Henry, Katie, and Elizabeth, and her 10 grandchildren were quite proud. One of the proudest was her five-year-old grandson, worshiping from afar in Leadville, Colorado, Stephen Harrelson. Now you know the rest of the story. So Je Jennifer's put a, a picture of my grandmother up. Um, that's, that's from her college yearbook that I scanned. Um, there's a, there's a, the little, the, the little uh, writing about the description says, when a girl takes a man's course and does it better than the men, there isn't much left to write about her. She is a girl that the University of Kentucky will always be proud of, and we hope there will be more in the future like her. So I think um, my grandmother's looking down at CDOT and sees all the wonderful women engineers and she smiles. So. Thank you so much, Chief Harrelson for bringing that to us. What a remarkable and heartfelt story. We really appreciate it. Let's go over to CATI director, Nick Farber, please. I can follow that. that. <laughs> Uh, wow. Um, I got I, <laughs> tears in my eyes, too. That was great, Steve. Um, I, I love listening to Paul Harvey on long road trips when I was a kid. I'll never forget that's the rest of the story. Um, that was that brought me back. Um, so um, I will make this quick. Um, the just like want to introduce um, to George Hippolyte, our new attorney general from the attorney general's office. We're really happy to have him on board. Um, you'll see him around the office and helping us out of CTIO meetings coming up in the future. Also, on Tuesday, the governor signed House Bill 221074, traffic violations on the Interstate 70 shoulder lanes. Um, the bill allows us to use our existing technology on uh, the Mountain Express lanes to charge people who use the lanes when they're closed and use it with vehicles that they're not allowed to use it uh, uh, on the express lanes, on the Mountain Express lane, like uh, the trailers. Uh, large trucks, um, pickup trucks pulling campers and boats. Um, we're trying to keep the lane as safe as possible. We had over 40,000 vehicles use the lane when it was closed last year. Um, thankfully, we haven't had an accident yet. Um, we, we message that it's just a matter of time and we want to prevent that from happening. Um, the legislation uh, allows the CTIO board to amend the toll evasion rulemaking uh, the rules that we have, and we will be starting that process in the near future, and we'll keep you, the commission abreast of what's going on as well. Yesterday at the CTIO board meeting, the board adopted our FY23 budget and also approved the FY23 fee-for-service interagency agreement that I will come to you in a little bit for approval. Um, and that's all I have in terms of a director's report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nick. Uh, let's go on to FHWA Division Administrator's report from John Cater, please. 
And we had a question here. Oh, okay, oh. go ahead. Yep, sorry, it's the awkward format, but um, uh, I just had a quick question for Nick if there was any updates on the North I-25, the P3 proposal. Yes, thank you. Uh, we met with them a few weeks ago um, for about two and a half hours, um, addressing any questions and comments they had about um, the project. Met with them with Region 1 and Region 4. Um, we walked through their ideas on that proposal and answered questions that they had regarding that. And that's, um, they're actually, they met with um, TTD staff a couple of days ago in terms of the greenhouse gas rule. And we're meeting with regions one and region four at different times in the coming weeks. So we continue to work on it diligently. Um, and also um, asked for an extension of time. We gave them until April 14th to turn in their detailed proposal. They asked for an additional month until May 12th, which we granted a few days ago as well. Thank you, Nick. Um, FHWA, John Cater. Uh, Nick, real, real quick, um, Nick, can you repeat the last sentence? that you said you cut out there, Katie, of course. Oh, sure thing. They, uh, we gave it, CTIO gave them. <laughs> did I cut out again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, can, you, can you just put it in the chat for us, maybe? Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to capture that because I'm not seeing chat. All right, well, um, thank you. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. Um, my, my house was kind of like Commissioner Bracky. My, my wife has her birthday today. So St. Patrick's Day is always a, have a double double special day with that. So uh, looking forward to uh, celebrating that this evening. A um, couple of things to mention. Uh, first off, we had a, a training session on Complete Streets here last week. That was a huge success. And Complete Streets is a term I think most of you probably heard, but uh, it, has, it has several definitions. But the one I, I'd like to use is as a complete street is a street that can safely and efficiently serve all users. And the key there, I mean, there's several keys there, I guess. Safety is, is, is probably preeminent, but it also has to be efficient. It, it, you know, we can do a lot of things to make things safe. We also have to be able to, to balance all the users. And one point that I think is critical when we're talking about safe streets or complete streets is that it's not a check. It's, you don't go down the list and go, oh, we got a bike path, oh, we got a sidewalk, oh, there's transit, oh, we're done. It's, it's not that. And sometimes I think we get, we want to, we want to make things, you know, quick and simple and things are rarely quick and simple. And so this, this training course really focused on the fact that you have to look at the corridor and look at the needs and look at what's, what's going on there and find the best solution for that corridor. And it's not always easy. And, you know, and it's not just CDOT either. This is, this is streets and streets is, is this, you know, the road in front of your house. It's, it's the one you use to get to the to the CDOT highway or whatever. It's, it's a lot of the rest of the network. And so it's really focusing on the entire network and making the entire network work better. Mm -hmm. And so I was really excited by this, this course. We had, uh, had a couple of our national experts taught it and uh, the demand was, was huge. We, uh, typically these have been held around the country and you have you know, 20, 30, 40 people. We had over 200 people approach us for interest. We had over a hundred that sat through the entire course and completed it and it was, all aspects of, of the broad, you know, transportation governmental community in, in Colorado. So it was, it wasn't just you know, city engineers and public works. It was parks departments and people involved in the ADA issues and hospital and, and uh, uh, parks and wildlife and local level, state level. Really a good cross section, a good mix of people who, who were part of the course. And so very successful in that respect. I think we're going to do a, an encore performance to do another session or two because there's such such interest and such. Man, um, MPOs, I forgot Dr. Cog, uh, North Front Range, and others who were part of it as well. So we had a lot of interest. And really, the, the key here is, is going forward, is finding when we do improvements, there's a need for improvements. So we have to we have to look re universe. We have to look at all the users, you know, and people we sometimes leave out, people who are, you know, uh, not just pedestrians, but, but ADA dependents. So we need to provide for people who are in wheelchairs or have other issues. There's a whole new aspect of people with, um, with the uh, skateboards and scooters and all of these these hybrid sorts of things, and we have to find safe ways for all these users to interact, and that's not easy. And so you, it's never going to be perfect for any one user, but it's finding the ways that, that work for all users. So anyway, that's a cool thing that's going on. Um, looking to see where that goes and how we can implement that more going forward. But uh, go ahead. Yeah, with that, do they look at as you um, possibly shift? a corridor or something, the impact of moving that traffic possibly into the neighborhoods to keep it on the main thoroughfare. I mean, because that's 
then one of my concerns on the state highway system, if we start restricting that, we actually possibly are pushing that traffic into the neighborhoods. Well, uh, I mean, it, it's yeah, a it's and it's a yeah, yeah and there, there's a great anecdote. Um, there was a, a project that was coming up to, to improve an interchange and the corridor coming away from it. And so uh, the, the team met with, with the, the bike community on what, what do you want to do? How can we help you? And they said, we don't want anything here because this is this is this is very dangerous to ride. Getting through interchanges is challenging, but there's a road that's two blocks over that that's where we use, and that works a lot better, and do some improvements over there, and that's a winner for everybody. And so that's the kind of thing I think it's, it's looking at the corridor and not just focusing on, oh, we're going to squeeze lanes and put a bike thing in. It's not going to work for anybody, really. And instead, find something that works much, much better for, for all the users. So that's the, that's the goal. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, many people recognize Mike Goolsby, and I want to add my voice to that. Mike, Mike has done a tremendous job. And, and I think for a degree of difficulty in the last three years, I, I look, you know, He's got, he's got a fire in Glenwood Canyon. He's got mudslides. He's got avalanches. He's got, you know, you know that's, that's a tough, tough uh, hand to get dealt. And he played it very, very well. He's done a great job. Uh, and one thing about Mike that was, was mentioned by others, you know, he didn't come up through the engineering path. He didn't come down, which is kind of the standard normal way you get to be an RTD, is he, he came through the maintenance route. And so, again, he's a special, unique individual who can, who can do that because that's, that's, that's not a deal that everybody can pull off. And, and Mike did it. He's done it with a great, with great attitude. His great, his demeanor, and it's just been, you know, been, you know, Mike. It's just been a privilege to work with you, and uh, wish you the best going forward. But you've been a great, great asset for for CDOT and for transportation in Colorado. So just want to wish you the best. So that's it for me. So thanks. Thank you, John. Appreciate your report. Uh, stack report by Vince Rogalski, please. You did that well. Um. <laughs> We had a stack meeting last Friday, and uh, it, it went very well. In fact, it went long. And so one of the things, the first things we started out with is an update from uh, Herman Stockinger about uh, CDOT's working on the federal grant applications for US 6 and Wadsworth Boulevard and three mobility hubs on the Western Slope. One of the, the most interesting things in this particular part of the meeting was the fact that uh, John Lermay gave us a, a, a presentation on intense conditions of snow plowing and safety concerns for drivers. Uh, it was very interesting. And it's kind of interesting that the, the danger on a open road without any particular dangers, but the dangers are from the drivers themselves, not the plow drivers, but the regular um, public drivers that are causing problems that cause accidents. And this also endangers the drivers. One of the things I commented on, true, is the fact that danger of driving snow plows on mountain passes are extreme, even without uh, public in interaction there. For example, we gave, I gave an example of Red Mountain Pass. Now, many of you have been over Red Mountain Pass with me in terms of uh, what that's like. And imagine a snow plow trying to plow a road with no guardrails and, and simply a big cliff on one side. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost several snow plow drivers over the years in terms of plowing that particular pass. Moving on uh, to TPR and MPO reports, um, everybody seems to be out there working on the update for the 10 year plan and uh, having meetings and chair meetings and this type of thing. So everybody's working hard trying to uh, meet the deadlines on how that's all gonna work. Uh, Andy Karsajian um, gave us an update on the legislative report and he's gonna update you in, uh, following here, uh, following me. And so he'll give you that. And one of the things that Stack talked about is regarding the safety stop bill. Um, and Senator Winter is open to conversing with CDOT about amendments. And CDOT and Bicycle Colorado agreed to continue working together regardless of the outcome of the bill. And that's great because there's many who conceive uh, this particular bill as a danger because if you don't stop at stop signs, uh, bicyclists, that is, 
um, there could be some uh, difficulty. Um, we had next we had two big discussions that really took up most of the meeting, and one was on uh, uh, GHG uh, greenhouse gas, and the other was on ten-year uh, plan transit, and they sort of interlock to somewhat extent. And the thing of it is, is there's a concern about what does the rule for greenhouse gas really mean for the rural areas and how is the rule gonna impact the, the rural areas? I know that um, Commissioner Stanton made comment yesterday about his concern for the greenhouse gas rule. And um, one of the things that people are really interested in is where is the list for mitigation measures? And it's gonna be given to STAC and CDOT um, as soon as it's finished. But uh, Commissioner Adams made a comment too that um, one of the stack members talked about is there's an interest in a cost benefit analysis of mitigation measures. And what does that mean in terms of, um, are we spending too much money on the measures and not enough money on other things that are necessary to reduce greenhouse gas? We had an update on, um, transit projects for the 10-year plan by Amber Blake. And you had that uh, discussion yesterday in which a lot of things were presented, uh, but it was really controversial for Stack to talk about a lot of the different things. And one of the things is um, the Stack members were concerned about CDOT reducing or redirecting, excuse me, redirecting funds from the 10% transit set aside to uh, operations and maintenance. Um, and this could decrease the amount of funding for local projects. And, and the plan presented reduces the money for pro local projects by 56%. That's a huge deduction. And, and it's really impacting a lot of people, especially uh, region one, I think dropped about $30 million. And so um, there's a real concern about that. Uh, funds uh, under the discussion also were 15% off the uh, MMOF funds specifically set aside for the state. And that was talked about being redirected for um, operations and maintenance. There's a suggestion, a suggestion that if uh, regions or TPRs and MPOs are going to lose money on this, can that be redirected for credit against the greenhouse gas. An interesting thought that um, not having the money be a credit to greenhouse gas. Um, the question about trade-off from greenhouse grass perspective and using this money for busting versus reducing local funding it is an interesting thing. We've just heard um, a lot of public opinion about the success and the need for increasing bus staying um, and the public's need for this. And I suggest that this is a particularly important time with the greenhouse gas rule coming out to not reduce transit, but to actually increase transit. And how, how do we do that? Well, one of the things to talk about is 10% transit off the top. The thing of it is, is that's a minimum that was set, 10%. So possibility increasing that percentage a little higher may provide uh, operation and maintenance money for CDOT so that bus tank can continue. And so there's a lot of other options around that I think that we need to bring more money into transit so that it continue to increase because we want transit to increase because we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas. Now we had two other areas that, that we really couldn't talk about. And one of them was um, transit demand management and rest area update. The rest area update that you had yesterday was really good and provided a good perspective on where that is. And we couldn't talk about those because we ran out of time. The one thing that wanted, uh, people wanted to talk about was the Cottonwood Pass overview uh, from Steve Harrelson. And the thing of it is, is um, we understand that uh, I-70 gets, gets uh, um, closed a lot of times. In fact, it was closed today 
because of the weather conditions. Um, and the shortest alternate route is Cottonwood Pass in Garfield and Eagle counties. Uh, Stack summarized the discussion with the counties um, staff did. Uh, design challenges and um, legal ownership challenges. And the process of going through this uh, raised concerns that the $1 million was assigned uh, without a discussion with Stack ahead of time. And so um, Stack meetings are getting bigger and longer. And so one of the things we're going to plan to do next meeting, which is in, in uh, April, is to start earlier, start at 8.30 in the morning rather than nine. So if you're planning to attend the stack meeting, it's gonna start at 8.30. So questions? Any questions for Vince? I don't have a question for Vince, but this kind of probably is between uh, Steve Harrelson and Nick. On the I-70, um, I've noticed, I think it's the York Bridge that was the new bridge. It looks like there's damage to it. It looked like it probably happened during the demolition of the viaduct. Um, is there any information on that? Yeah, so um, when the viaduct was being uh, knocked down, one of the columns fell on one of the on one of the girders and cracked it. So we have removed that, or we're in the process of removing that girder. There was one further inside that was also a suspect. Um, so that those two girders are being replaced, and then the deck will be poured. And parallel with that project, there's a girder on the other side of the bridge that had not yet been installed. So they're replacing the two damaged girders and then one new girder and, and reconstructing that bridge. It's all on the contractor. Um, you know, it was their mistake. So uh, it, it's all taken care of. But it, it I think uh, you know, if memory serves that they're just getting going on that and it should be uh, six or eight weeks. It's not going to affect the critical path of the project. It's Correct. Steve's point, contractors pay. Yeah. Okay. Do you know, just for information, how much does that sort of a a thing cost to fix? Is there kind of an estimate? Um, I don't know. Seven hundred twelve thousand thirty-two dollars and twelve cents. I'll hold you to that dollar. It, it, it's less less than a million, probably less than five hundred thousand. You know, it's um, on a design build. It's a little different because we don't have bid pay items. It's kind of a complete in place contract. Um, right. Several hundred thousand dollars. And because the contractor didn't even try and contest that we should pay for it, we don't have a specific cost estimate because they're just doing it. Yeah. But uh, that order just, of magnitude. Yeah, I was just interested just in, you know, what kind of, what does that cost when something like that happens? Just for base information. Thank you. <laughs> to the state, nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the other things that we talked about I-70, one of the other um, detours for I-70 when it's closed is Highway 50. And that goes through uh, Little Blue Creek Canyon, which is under construction and has another year to go in construction. In fact, they're supposed to start this week in uh, doing some limited closures. So if you're driving Highway 50 between Gunnison and Montrose, be sure and check to see it, uh, what kind of closures they're happening. Uh, they're not full closures yet, but they uh, may have alternate um, lanes and trying to get through that canyon. So um, once it's through, uh, it's going to be really an important improvement to, to the uh, Highway 50 between Montrose and Gunnison. Any more questions for Vince? Vince, thank you very much for extensive report. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you. to legislative with Andy Carson, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna be brief. I know that you got some, some time constraints. So just a very quick acknowledgement to Mike Goolsby as well. It would be remiss of me not to mention all the many times that legislators have contacted me and then I've contacted Mike and he uh, has helped me out with, with the problems and, and tamping down what in, in my position is often more about personalities than it is about the problems. So thank you very much to Mike and, 
and uh, best of luck moving on. It's St. Patty's Day. I have an Irish wife. I have to wear my Irish tie all day, so that's why I'm wearing that. And then for uh, the legislative update, you had the, the notice that we got our bill signed on 1074. That's the managed lane. That was very exciting. We have the, of course, uh, the next day we had all of our uh, boards and transportation commissioners uh, go through the Senate committees. Congratulations to Commissioners Stewart and Holguin and Garcia, Adams and Hart. You guys did amazing in front of the uh, legislative committee. I know that Senator Scott gave you some weird questions. All of you were wonderful and, and polite and respectful and, and appropriate and professional and representative CDOT very well as well as the uh, Clean Transit Enterprise Board and the Non-Attainment Boards. Everybody did a wonderful job and it was great to uh, see you all in front of the Transportation Committee. So congratulations. Uh, some other conversations legislatively, a bill uh, in regards to the broadband or the uh, developing a fee permit to lay down fiber in our right of way passed out of committee yesterday. Bob Pfeiffer testified on that in committee, did a wonderful job, passed out unanimously. The bike safety stop bill also passed out unanimously on the Senate Transportation Committee on Monday. Um, as was mentioned earlier, they did amend the bill to accommodate the all of the things that we requested. Um, so we didn't even testify on the bill. It looks like it's in a better space now. Uh, we do have the most important thing is, of course, we do have the ability to sign those controlled intersections. Um, where CDOT and local governments deem unsafe for safety stops. So we have that ability as well. Um, let's see, what else did we have going on? 151, this is the wildlife crossing bill that continues to get some good uh, attention. We've had some great conversations about that. That was unfortunately delayed one week and will be heard on I believe the 28th or the 29th, uh, the last week of, of March there. Uh, only because they canceled the transportation commission or committee meeting for next week, for whatever reason they decided to. Um, that is primarily it for my update. Just so you all know, we won't have a legislative update call tomorrow for the commission, just because you know, when we have these updates for you during this, I won't waste your time tomorrow as well. So with that, happy to answer any questions and thank you all very much. Any questions for Andy? Andy, thank you very much for keeping us uh, updated and all your work up on the Hill. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all. Okay, let's move into uh, the consent agenda. But before we do, I need to get a commissioner and another to make a uh, motion to remove proposed resolution number five, which is the right of way condemnation authorization. That's supposed to be out of the consent agenda. Would somebody make a motion to remove it in a second so that we can work on that separately? Thanks, Stuart, move to remove. Motion to remove. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. And is there a second? Gary Beatty, I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Beatty. So that is removed. So we are now down to proposed resolution one, two, three, and four. And Herman, uh, that's it. Uh, we can do them together on the consent agenda. Do you have any other comments, Herman? No. Okay. Gary, we need... I move to approve uh, the consent agenda. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Beatty. Uh, motion. And do we have a second? Second, Karen Stewart. Karen Stewart. Uh, seconds it. Is there any discussion? Is anyone opposed to the consent agenda motion? Hearing none, this motion carries. Let's go on to that proposed resolution number five, right away condemnation. And Steve Harrelson, our chief engineer, will discuss that. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I went over this situation yesterday in uh, the workshop. It is a, uh, a proposed condemnation of a one fee parcel and two temporary easements. Um, it's in the town of Clifton, uh, adjacent to US 6. Um, the, uh, the information is in your packets, but I would be happy to ask, answer any questions that you might have having reviewed that. 
Thank you, Engineer Harrelson. Um, is there a motion to approve proposed resolution number five? Mary Beatty, I still move. Thank you, Commissioner Beatty. Moves. Is there a second? Second, Lisa Hickey. Thank you, Commissioner Hickey. And uh, open it up for discussion on this proposed resolution number five right away condemnation. Any discussion? Okay, uh, is anyone opposed to proposed resolution number five? Hearing none, this motion proposed resolution number five carries. Let's go to proposed resolution number six, which is the budget supplement of fiscal year 22 with Jeff Sudemeyer and Bethany Nicholas. Good morning. Um, I'm requesting your approval of the ninth supplement to the fiscal year 22 CDOT budget. Um, the ninth supplement includes one item. That's a request to increase by 2.5 million the budget on uh, the US 6 North Avenue project in region three. Uh, the increase is composed of approximately 800,000 in surface treatment funds and 1.7 million in SB1 strategic projects, 10 uh, year plan funds. Um, the, the SB1 funds are available as a result of savings on the US 6 Fruta to Palisades safety improvement project uh, in the 10 year plan. Um, both, both that project and this project that the funds are moving into are both 10 year plan projects. Uh, the funds are being requested in order to award the project to the low bidder. Uh, the primary drivers of the high bid amount uh, are thought to be due to additional costs related to required nighttime paving as well as additional costs in installation of curb and gutter, milling and paving operations due to additional traffic control uh, restrictions on the corridor. Um, the region does not anticipate a better outcome were they to go back out to bid, and as such are requesting uh, this increase in order to award the project. Happy to answer any questions, otherwise I'd request you consider a motion to approve. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, is there a motion to approve proposed resolution number six for the budget supplement of fiscal year 22? Commissioner Vasquez, I move to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez, and a second. Commissioner Garcia, second. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia, for seconding. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, is anyone, any commissioner opposed to proposed resolution number six, the budget supplement for fiscal year 22? Hearing none, uh, this proposed resolution number six passes. Let's move on to discuss and act on proposed resolution number seven, which is a final uh, FY22-23 budget allocation plan. Jeff Sudemeyer again. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting your approval of the final fiscal year 23 CDOT budget allocation plan. Uh, the fiscal year 23 budget allocates nearly 1.8 billion in revenue to programs, including nearly 750 million to capital construction, more than 400 million to maintenance and operations, and nearly 375 million to sub-allocated or local pass-through programs. Uh, expenditures in fiscal year 23 are estimated to exceed 2.2 billion, including 1.2 billion in capital construction. Um, we reviewed the final budget and workshop yesterday, which followed on workshops uh, with the commission in October, uh, November, and February. Um, upon your approval, we'll submit the final fiscal year 23 budget uh, to the governor's office ahead of an April submission deadline. I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'd again request a motion to approve. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have an, a motion to approve uh, proposed resolution number seven? Uh, Commissioner Garcia, I believe that's resolution eight, and I move to approve. No, seven. It's seven. 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 okay, Commissioner yeah. Garcia. We appreciate your motion for this proposed resolution on final budget allocation uh, plan. Do we have a second? Commissioner Bracky. Thank you, Commissioner Bracky, for your second. Any discussion? Hearing none, is anyone opposed to proposed resolution seven? This uh, proposed resolution seven final budget allocation plan passes. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, discussing and acting on proposed resolution number eight, which is 
the fiscal year 22-23 CTIO fee for service, IAA approval, Nick Farber. Thank you, Commissioner Sam. Um, this is our yearly request uh, <clears throat> to the commission for our fee for service allocation from the Transportation Commission um, in recognition of the specialized nature and expertise in the services that CTO, CTIO provides CDOT, CDOT pays us an annual fee for service through the interagency agreement that we're asking you to approve today. Um, uh, CTIO this year is asking for $4 million for a fee for service allocation, which is the same amount we asked for last year, even though we are seeing uh, significant cost increases um, because of the patrolling back office procurement and other and uh, two new corridors coming on South Gap and Westbound Mountain Expressway in the coming year. We are um, we are keeping our request the same, but we are, are using a lot more toll revenue to pay for our, our expenses um, as these tolling corridors, express lane corridors come online. Um, for instance, uh, we recently hired a tolling and operations uh, supervisor. And uh, in the last uh, four months, he's been on board. Uh, he has decreased our, our leakage anywhere between 60 and 90% on our quarters, which has essentially paid for his position this year. Um, also, in, if you look closely in the IA, it outlines our scope of work that we will provide CDOT in the upcoming year. Um, we will implement and oversee a contract compliance and monitoring framework for the Central 70 project agreement. Um, we are currently working with the Central 70 project on that. And we will have that ready to go by the time the Central 70 project is ready for operations around this time next year. We are also responsible for leading and processing uh, all of our and complying with our all of our FHW reporting requirements under the Tiger Build and Infragrant Agreements on I-25 North um, and the Mountain the Westbound Mountain Express Line. And we will also work on implementing dynamic tolling, also co called congestion pricing across our express line system. Um, this sophisticated tolling strategy will provide optimal congestion management over the over current time of day uh, that we've charged now. Um, that's all I have in terms of our interagency agreement. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And if not, I ask for your approval of the resolution. Thank you, Nick. Um, do we have a motion to approve proposed resolution eight, the CTIO IAA fee for service? Karen Stewart, so moved, approval of 2022-23 CTIO fee for service, IAA. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. Do we have a second? Second, no, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia for seconding. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, is anyone opposed to proposed resolution eight? Proposed resolution eight therefore passes CTIO fee for service IAA. And that completes our resolutions. Is there any other business which should come before the Transportation Commission today? No, I would note if I if I may chair, we had a request uh, to move the we were going to have the, the fiber workshop after the bridge enterprise for a variety of reasons, including the fact that, that Bob Pfeiffer has some fun uh, show and tell items that would be better suited to a to a, a live meeting. We'd like to push that after Bridge Enterprise and not do it, and we'll do it in April if that's okay. That's the only uh, other announcement or item to discuss. Thank you very much, Herman. Uh, that's a great recommendation, and we look forward to Bob Pfeiffer, John LeMay on Fiber in April. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone has for the commission? If not, we'll adjourn the commission and immediately convene the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise Board of Directors meeting. And we'll do the call of order and roll call. Herman, please. Director Olkin? Yeah. Director Adams? He is here okay. on the screen. Director Stewart? Here. Director Bracky? Here. Director Vasquez? Yes. Director Garcia? Here. Director Hickey? Here. Director Hart? Here. Here. Director Beatty? Here. Uh, Vice Chair Stanley? Here. And Chair Hall?
excused. Thank you, Herman. Uh, do we have any public comments to come before the bridge and tunnel enterprise? No, sir, we don't. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, let's act on the consent agenda. This is proposed resolution BTE1 for the regular meeting minutes. Uh, Herman's in charge. Um, is there a motion to approve BTE1? So moved. Second. Second, Lisa Hickey. Okay, Lisa Hickey, second. And I didn't catch who moved. Gary Beatty. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Beatty. Any discussion? No discussion. Anyone opposed? BTE resolution one passes. Uh, let's discuss uh, proposed resolution BTE2, the seventh budget supplement for fiscal year 22 with Jeff Sudmeyer. Jeff? Hello, uh, I'm requesting your approval of the seventh supplement to the fiscal year 22 bridge and tunnel enterprise budget. Um, there are two items in the seventh supplement. Uh, the first is a request to increase the design phase budget for I-70 Floyd Hill to continue design activities uh, for the bridge and tunnel enterprise eligible portions of that project. Um, the BTE eligible portions include two poor rated structures. One is a top tier structure uh, and the other is a second tier structure in the uh, most recent January 22 uh, BTE prioritization plan. Um, the increase will add 10 million in faster bridge funds uh, to the existing uh, 1.5 million in design budget. Um, the budget request uh, was developed based on uh, estimated BTE eligible um, proportional share of the overall to total project design costs. So, um, so that uh, that 10 million is essentially the estimated uh, uh, portion of the total design costs that to be attributed uh, to the uh, to the two structures in question. Um, the second request is a request to establish the design phase budget uh, for the replacement of six bridges on I-270 in Adams County in Region 1 uh, with 466,400 in faster bridge funds. Uh, this will fund the design of these structures through preliminary design. Um, the six bridges uh, will be bundled with two other non-BTE eligible bridges uh, and delivered as the I-270 critical bridges project in advance of the separate uh, larger I-270 safety and mobility project. Um, both, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, both the I-270 project uh, and the Floyd Hill project are obviously 10-year plan projects. Um, in the case of I-270, we're accelerating the replacement of the structures ahead of the, uh, the larger I-270 project due to the increasing frequency and severity of, of uh, planned and unplanned deck repairs. Uh, which have created maintenance uh, and safety concerns as well as disruptions for the traveling public. Um, happy to answer any questions. Uh, otherwise, I would request uh, another motion to approve. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have a motion to approve BTE number two resolution? Karen Stewart, motion to approve BTE two. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart, and a second. Commissioner Vasquez, second. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez. Discussion? Hearing none, does anyone not approve of proposed resolution BTE2? Proposed resolution BTE2 passes. Let's do proposed resolution BTE3, which is fiscal year 22 raise grant applications. Again, Jeff Sudmeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting your approval of a resolution that establishes a commitment in principle uh, to fund the replacement of the bridge enterprise eligible structure US 6 over State Highway uh, 1, 121 or more commonly 6th and Wadsworth. Um, uh, as part of the state, this, uh, this commitment in principle would uh, um, be part of the state match um, for the larger US 6th and Wadsworth interchange improvement project that we plan to submit for the fiscal year 22 raise grant program. Um, BTE staff are requesting uh, this commitment in principle of up to 20 million uh, based on high level cost estimates by the project team. Uh, with your approval of this resolution, we will identify up to 20 million as available state match through BTE. BTE sorry. Um, if the grant is awarded, we'll return to the board requesting a formal commitment of funding uh, through the budget supplement process. 
I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, request a motion to approve. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have a motion to approve uh, the ETE 322 raise grant application? Chair, we have a question here first, if we could. Sure, go ahead. Um, my question has to do um, on this particular item. Are we specifically at, um, acting upon the funding for the application for US 6 and Wadsworth, or is this broader to address all of the race applications? This is just specific to US 6 and Wadsworth. So I, I described it as a commitment in principle. Uh, what that means is, is somewhat as it sounds, we are, we're asking you to essentially uh, say that if the grant is successful, uh, your intention is to come back and formally commit BTE funds up to $20 million for the, uh, the, the bridge enterprise eligible structure at US 6 and WADS. So, yep. so this is specific to that um, raise application and that specific bridge and tunnel enterprise funding. Yeah, and I can address perhaps the larger, the larger question. Um, we, we will bring to the commission requests like this if there isn't already approval um, for funding that we would be using as match. So we hadn't yet gone through any selection process through the commission for dollars to the, to the Six and Wadsworth Bridge. So for instance, 119, we have the match dollars. Commission has already essentially approved those dollars, move the move application, we have those match dollars. So we're not needing to come back and say, commitment in principle for these, but Bridge Enterprise, that this was the one project, Six and Wadsworth, and it does also have other 10-year plan funds that have been approved that we'll be using as the match. It's just the bridge enterprise funds hadn't yet gone through the commission. So we're doing that before we submit an application. Okay, thank you. So this is in the 10-year plan. And does it have funding allocated in the 10-year plan? Yes. Or is it, okay, yes. Allocated funds. Right, but the bridge enterprise funds weren't yet in the 10-year plan for it. Okay, I just... I just wanted to clarify that it was this is specific to this particular race grant that project and it doesn't apply to the other. Correct. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other discussion on BTE number three? Could we have a motion to approve a BTE three raise grant application 22? So moved, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia, and a second. Second, Thank you, Commissioner Holguin. And uh, we've had our discussion. Um, is anyone opposed to proposed resolution BTE number three? Hearing none, BTE three, raise grant application fiscal year 22 is approved. Moving on to proposed resolution BTE number four, which is the fiscal year 22-23 final budget allocation plan, Jeff Sudmeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting your approval of the final fiscal year 23 bridge and tunnel enterprise budget. Um, this action is the companion uh, to the action you just took as the Transportation Commission, uh, approving the uh, final fiscal year 23 CDOT budget. Uh, the fiscal year 23 BTE budget allocates $145.2 million uh, in revenue to programs, including nearly $95 million to capital construction uh, and $48 million to debt service, which includes debt service on the original uh, BE Build America bonds, as well as a fiscal year 23 uh, availability payment on Central 70 of approximately 31 million. Um, we review, reviewed the final budget with you several times over the last few months, uh, most recently in February. Uh, there are no significant changes from the version of the budget that I presented to you in workshop, uh, um, or at the, I should say, at the uh, BTE meeting uh, in February. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I would request one last motion to approve. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have a motion to approve BTE number four, which is a final budget allocation plan? Gary Beatty, I move to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Beatty. How about a second? Second, Commissioner Hickey. Thank you, Commissioner Hickey. Any discussion? Hearing none, is any commissioner opposed to proposed resolution BTE number four? None heard, so proposed resolution BT number four passes, which completes the uh, business of the bridge and tunnel enterprise 
Uh, Herman, is there any other matters that need to come before the BTE? No. Thank you. Uh, BTE is adjourned. Um, hope everyone has a safe drive back that's in Denver. And as uh, Herman had mentioned, our fiber program will be shifted to a workshop in April with John Lermay and Bob Pfeiffer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.